Okay, why don't we get started? So it's a great pleasure today to have uh, Dr. Paul Unma. He was supposed to be in person, but there were some issues. He had to actually uh, meet some uh, colleagues uh, from the Department of Energy, so it didn't really work in the end. Um, that's unfortunate, but we are very lucky. We can actually do a relatively good hybrid setup these days. Uh, and uh, that's actually part of Climate Week. So we were also excited to have Dr. Paul Unma actually as part of Climate Week as well to kind of showcase that we can also use AI for different types of climate uh, analysis. So that could be of interest for a various uh, more diverse audience as well. So uh, Dr. Paul Ma is actually an Earth uh, scientist uh, in the Atmospheric Science and Global Change Division of PNNL, so the Pacific and Northwest National Lab. For those of you who actually know that, that's part of the Department of Energy. Uh, they are doing a lot of very interesting research, uh, very modern computing uh, infrastructure as well. And Polun has been actually co-leading one of the uh, very interesting projects called Eagles, uh, which is actually trying to look at the role of aerosols on the atmosphere and especially on clouds and looking at aerosol cloud interaction. And they've been doing uh, quite a bit of innovation in terms of using AI, not just in terms of models, but also to look at observations and trying to better understand and disentangle the role of aerosols. So with that, uh, very happy to have you here, Colin, and please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pierre, for the generous and kind introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Colin Ma. I am a scientist at the ASGC at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, my apologies that I couldn't be there in person. Uh, I mean, everything was scheduled, and I was really excited to, to go, and this is one of the most uh, exciting trips that I uh, planned, but then uh, three program managers are coming for a site visit uh, exactly today, and I just finished the briefing with them uh, this morning and need to have three other meetings with them uh, in the afternoon. So it's uh, it's something that we have to do when program managers make site visit. But I hope that this is a, a good opportunities for us to learn a little bit from each other uh, of what we do and then um, find opportunities where we can uh, uh, collaborate and maybe uh, help each other. So today I'm going to talk about uh, um, how do we improve the representation of aerosol in air system models with AI ML. And let's see if the slides can move, can actually move. Okay, so uh, first of all, I want to remind everybody that the role of aerosol in the climate system remain a major source of uncertainty on the left plot here, you will see that uh, this is uh, a very interesting figure from this Schlund et al. Uh, three years ago that estimated the uh, uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity since the Charney report in 1979. And over 40 years, the uncertainty range doesn't really reduce. It actually increases. And CMIP-6 says that the uh, uncertainty range for this is 1.5 to all the way to 5.5. Of course, there are some discussion about how um, these uh, high climate sensitivity models uh, have some uh, issues so that uh, they are, uh, uh, need to be uh, uh, considered in a different way. But then uh, we can't deny that uh, the climate science community has worked very hard to understand what controls the uncertainty of the, of the climate system and our climate projections. And one thing that remains the major uncertainty is the aerosol effects on the climate system. So here is from the IPCC AR5, it illustrates that in AR4, the effective radiative forcing associated with aerosol cloud interactions ranges between a half a watt to 2.5 watts, and AR5 doesn't really reduce that range. And here, the satellite um, estimate says that this is, this uh, uh, aerosol effective radiative forcing should be less than one watt. So there's a large discrepancy between uh, climate model estimates and the uh, satellite estimates. In the latest uh, re IPCC report, the uh, AR6, uh, the ERF-ACI uh, still remains a very large uncertainty here. That's still between something like a half watt or two watts. So uh, this is a uh, has been a, a research challenge for the climate research communities for uh, over several decades now. So our goal, of course, uh, is hopefully we can achieve unprecedented uh, realism in predictions of the role of aerosol and aerosol cloud interactions in the Earth system. 
through the combination of advancing fundamental science and utilizing modern data science and computational methods to address critical challenges facing the nation and the world, of course. Uh, here, I want to show you a movie of uh, cloud and aerosol evolution in a month. This is from the DOE's Earth System model called the E3SM. Uh, the white uh, is, of course, clouds, and the orange stuff is the, the aerosol index. And I'm showing the cloud optical depth and aerosol index. So what's wrong with this movie? What, what, uh, you can see that they, are they, they don't really represent the real world uh, features. Because for example, we see all these this, uh, checkerboard patterns and that's the result of a, a very coarse resolution. And we see, we don't have a lot of convections going on in the tropics and we have some storm systems here. And we see a huge signal from uh, a huge aerosol signal out of Asia, but not every place, any place else. The dust that is not a strong signal. And the background aerosol is almost invisible. We don't see any uh, background aerosol here. So with this coarse resolution climate model, we can really do a good job of simulating aerosol or clouds or aerosol cloud interactions. So this has been recognized and this has been a a big technical challenge for the climate uh, modeling uh, community. The course resolution is sufficient to resolve aerosol and ACI, and that uh, the other aerosol and cloud biases also point to deficiency in both state and processes of aerosol and clouds. And there's a, there are several common challenges in simulating aerosol effects in the climate system. The common challenge number one, I would say, is the low back background uh, or natural aerosol, which results in very low in, uh, background droplet number concentration. This is a paper published uh, almost 10 years ago and it has been provided guidance uh, for the climate uh, community for the last decade which says that the 45% of the variance of aerosol forcing uh, stems from the uncertainties in natural aerosol emissions. And that results point to the importance of understanding pristine pre-industrial like environments with natural aerosols only. So of course, uh, this model certainly is not the uh, current state of the art model. So there are perhaps those uh, uh, quantities can be adjusted because we now know that there are uh, Cloud processes that also play a very important role and things like that. But there's no disagreement on the fact that we need to understand the background aerosol and the pre-industrial light environments uh, so that we can uh, have a better handle on the aerosol cloud interactions. And why is that? The reason uh, is, has been demonstrated in multiple places, and these are the two examples, that uh, when you see that the anthropogenic emissions, perhaps uh, and the, the response of a CCN concentration to aerosol uh, emissions, the response is roughly linear. But then in terms of the response of cloud droplet con number concentration and CCN concentration, it becomes nonlinear. And the cloud albedo change versus cloud droplet uh, concentration is also nonlinear. So, the cloud albedo susceptibility to aerosol perturbation uh, depends on the base, unperturbed the base state. If your pre-industrial condition is right here, that has a very low uh, number here, and you are trying to you make the same perturbation here, then, then you change the cloud albedo a lot. But if your base climate state, unperturbed state is right here, then you change the same amount of aerosol emissions, you don't see a lot of changes in uh, cloud albedos. So that's why uh, it's very important that we get the base state uh, correct. And But then because there's really not a lot of uh, a trustworthy, reliable source of uh, measurements or observations to give us an idea of the pre-industrial aerosol conditions or uh, um, environmental conditions. So we need to find a proxy and the Southern Ocean has been considered as a proxy for pre-industrial environment and the inter-hemisphere droplet number concentration difference can serve as a constraint. This is a very nice paper published by Isabel McCoy in PINAS. And they found that uh, the uh, models, the climate models generally produce a very much lower droplet number concentration 
in the uh, in DJF in the austral summertime compared to the uh, MODIS satellite observations. So it's actually a factor of two lower than the observed value. And uh, because Southern Ocean is away from human influence, so that can be used as a proxy for pre-industrial condition. And if you calculate uh, the relationship between the droplet number concentration difference between Northern and Southern Hemisphere, that correlates very well with the droplet number concentration between present day and pre-industrial conditions. So that's why we say that uh, the inter-hemisphere uh, difference in droplet number concentration can be, can be used as a constraint for the, uh, pre uh, the present day and pre-industrial difference. So that was the challenge number one that we need to get our base state correctly. Challenge number two is the overly strong cloud albedo effect. This is the paper published in about our group. Uh, this is the um, droplet number concentration versus the CCN concentration from E3SM, the DOE's climate model versus the observations. So I want you to focus on the, the two um, issues here. One is that, uh, well, the model seems to generate a much tighter correlation between CDNC and CCN, while in the observation, they are more scattered. That means there are other factors that's affecting CDNC instead of just that are being solely affected by CCN. And the second thing is that uh, if we do a regression, you can see that uh, the slope in the model is roughly one, uh, one to one, uh, aligned very well with the one to one line. But then the slope in this, uh, based on observational data, then the slope is flatter. It's not, not a one-to-one. -one. So this points to the deficiency in representing the how the aerosols are being activated and uh, become the drop, uh, cloud droplets. And the common challenge number three is that we the models typically have overly strong cloud lifetime effect. And this is the susceptibility of precipitation probability to aerosols. And we see observation shows a very low uh, su uh, uh, susceptibility, but then the model has a generally much larger susceptibility here. And increasing resolution improves the agreement with the observations and that uh, this, uh, this uh, model deficiency also points to the deficiency in representing warm rain processes and cloud adjustments. So we need to understand why why uh, the models are not doing a good job here. So uh, our approach is that we combine a lot of data, we collect a lot of data from observations, uh, the measurements from ARM and other um, sources and uh, surface measurements and long-term surface measurements, field campaign data and satellite measurements. We combine them and collect uh, the information about aerosols, cloud precipitation and meteorology. We also use a lot of process models and large AD simulations uh, to provide information on aerosols, cloud precipitation, and meteorology, and all this um, data combined, we create a process-oriented diagnostics to understand model and real-world features and how they differ. And in fact, they, we also found that, that in some cases, uh, the if you use uh, measure different uh, source of measurements to uh, generate the same diagnostics, they uh, often give you different uh, answers as well. So we also need to understand the measurement uncertainties and the uh, uh, what, how to use them correctly to constrain our model. So we did a lot of study, and here I'm uh, I don't have enough time to describe all of them, but just briefly. Uh, we published two papers on the, uh, developing the e ESMAC diagnostics package so that we can use them quickly to generate hundreds of diagnostics and statistical uh, analysis and figures to facilitate model evaluation. And we, Adam Varbo uh, leads the work to assess and constrain the cloud's albedo susceptibility using ARM and satellite measurements. He, one of the most exciting thing that he found is that uh, to reconcile the different estimates from our measurements and satellites uh, uh, estimates. And uh, the key difference is because um, the satellite measurements assume a constant cloud adiabaticity when they retrieve the liquid pattern and construct those relationships. 
but in fact, uh, the it's actually a highly variable uh, uh, quantity. So if you account for the um, very the fact that the uh, cloud adiabaticity is variable, then the two measurements can agree. And Charlotte Bill uh, just submitted the paper to constrain warm rain processes using satellite observations. This is based on Kenta Suzuki's earlier work on uh, the cloud set modest CFAT analysis. So we updated uh, this diagnostics and updated uh, the reference data to include more samples. And we were able to demonstrate that uh, this is a very good constraint on the droplet collection, on the droplet collection uh, efficiency, which uh, contribute to oil conversions. Laura Fears uh, wrote a paper to quantify the structural error of aerosol size distribution in the modal aerosol treatments using the particle resolve the aerosol model. And he, she found that the uh, when uh, the, the, the modal treatment has a fixed standard deviation that typically gives you a very wide um, aerosol size distribution that can have downstream effect on the CCN activations and uh, cloud radiative forcing. Matt Christensen lead the work to assess the aerosol ERF using a Lagrange framework and use satellites and um, um, data and then did a, a, a ERF a decomposition analysis to find out that the cloud albedo effect is uh, way too strong and the uh, lifetime effect is also a little strong compared to the observation. And Johannes Mumenstadt found that we need to um, really constrain the one rate process if we want to reduce the aerosol forcing uncertainty. So all this nice work help us to understand the fundamental issues in the model that why the model doesn't reproduce the real world aerosol cloud interactions. But there are uh, challenges. So now since the Department of Energy has the ambition to go to a kilometer scale global simulations, we need to design our model parameterizations uh, for that uh, kilometer scale uh, E3SM. And we also need to design the all those diagnostics for the uh, for the kilometer scale. So we reproduce the um, MODIS uh, data um, uh, and then uh, generate this liquid path droplet number concentration joint histogram. On the left, you see this is a very, uh, has been well established by Ed Grispeer uh, from UK that uh, this is a very good constraint on the uh, aerosol uh, lifetime effect. So you see this inverted V shape that on the left part is shows the uh, with the increase of droplet number, you see an increase in liquid path. So uh, through this precipitation suppression effect, but after some point, uh, at some point, you, this uh, uh, relationship starts to reverse, and this is due to the entrainment, evaporation, the adjustment processes that has been observed from high resolution models. But when we reproduce this diagnostics uh, using the five kilometer data, then we found this, uh, this is way more complicated than the inverted V shape. So the two figures here are from exactly the same uh, MODIS data. The only difference is that one is aggregated to one degree, one side, the other is aggregated to five kilometers. So apparently the real world is telling us that uh, there are multiple uh, uh, mechanisms that's going on. And we are currently working on using some explainable AI algorithms to decipher this signal and reveal the intrinsic relationships in this nonlinear system. So, I mean, just visually eyeballing it, I see that there are uh, at least uh, two modes uh, here, but we, we don't know what's going on. So this is uh, still uh, under investigation. Uh, I want to briefly uh, now talk about what we have been doing in this uh, EGOS project, which stands for Enabling Aerosol Cloud Interactions at Global Convection Permitted Scales. We have been tasked to develop improved treatments for aerosol and aerosol cloud interactions for future E3SM running at three kilometer resolution globally. And this project has two national labs and uh, five funded university partners and one unfunded university partner. And we treat, we improve the treatment of sea spray aerosols, mineral dust, wildfire aerosols, 
uh, and the, all the necessary chemistry for biogenic SOA and anthropogenic carbonations and sulfate aerosols. We need to improve the, the treatments on emissions, the chemical and physical processes, and those are important for improve aerosol properties, life cycle, and distribution. And we need to have a better handle on the composition, hygroscopicity, and optics because they are important for the downstream effect on aerosol radiation cloud precipitation interactions and how aerosols can affect aerosols and affect cloud and affect the precipitation. We are also tasked to do all this work in a modern software uh, infrastructure for exascale computation. So this model needs to be able to run for three kilometer resolution globally to inform short-term small scale features. Uh, to the low resolution model uh, for CMIP type simulations to inform longer term large scale uh, environment. So this is a, a, a software um, development work. Uh, we call that the original aerosol uh, code is MAN4 and we add the uh, XX here to demonstrate that this is a new code that can achieve global kilometer scale simulations of aerosol and ACI with C++ cocos. And our approach uh, before, because we can't always run global three kilometer resolutions, it's just uh, too computationally uh, expensive. So we develop a, a liquid cloud test bed approach to combine data and models, and we identify three test bed regions in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern ocean. The uh, three in the northern hemisphere are under a strong influence. As uh, strong anthropogenic influences and the one in the Southern Ocean is used as a proxy for pre-industrial conditions. And these areas are identified because there are a lot of field campaigns and uh, long-term observations uh, nearby. So we can take them and compile all the data uh, accordingly to uh, evaluate our model for uh, tests and evaluation. And the Southern Ocean has marine clouds with low aerosol concentrations. East North Atlantic has diverse subtropical clouds and susceptible to aerosols. Central US has continental convective clouds with high aerosol concentration. Northeast Pacific is a transition in stratocumulus to trade cumulus. So you can see that we have uh, combined the satellite observations and also the arm measurements. And this is the one degree E3SM simulations and the three kilometer regional refined mesh are also built for those to test the high resolution behavior in those regions. And we also perform a lot of large AD simulations for those uh, locations uh, driven by the real, uh, real world conditions. Uh, so now we, in terms of improving the aerosol and ACI for the next generation E3SM, we have found that uh, this is on the left, you see this is a, a one degree model on the right is a three kilometer model. So we can see that uh, uh, certainly on the right, the clouds and aerosol uh, distribution transport looks maybe more realistic and of course prettier. On the left, they are um, all kind of, uh, smoothed out and there are clouds and aerosols that are overlapping all the time. And on the right, you can see the clouds and aerosols are segregated. And when they're segregated, they don't interact with each other. But then of course, better picture doesn't mean the better prediction because we have already identified that when, uh, when you increase the resolution, you only improve some aspects, but not all aspects of the, of the ACI because there are still missing or deficient me mechanisms in the model and we need to include them uh, to improve the uh, simulation. If we don't include them just by increasing the resolution, those mechanisms won't just uh, pop up by itself. Uh, we show that in the high resolution, so this is the decomposition of ERF ACI uh, from the E3SM one degree model on the left and the th uh, three kilometer model on the right in these four different regions. So this is a total ERF ACI. Um, in these four regions, when you increase the resolution, you can always see some uh, the, about 30% reduction in ERF ACI. 
So if the SM version two has that EFA cell minus 1.35 watts per square meter, if we apply this 30% globally, that's uh, put this model right in the middle of the AR6 assessment. And we do this decomposition to separate that the total ERF-ACI into two mean effect, the liquid path adjustments and cloud fractional adjustments. And you can see that they all decrease uh, accordingly. But it's, this is just uh, the, the modeling results and they might not be due to the right reasons. And at least uh, another thing to mention here is that the liquid path adjustments uh, is uh, generally believed that to be a positive value, but in this um, analysis, we show that even though we increase the resolution to three kilometers, it, it reduces the magnitude, but the sign is still negative. And this is another point I want to make. Um, the black and the gray line, so in this NDCCN space, the black line represent the regression from the observations and the blue line represents the regression from the one degree model and the orange line is from the three kilometer RM. So you can see that the model, the droplet number in the model is significantly underestimated by a factor of two to four, depending on where you are. Uh, in this analysis, we show that when the model resolution increases uh, from uh, one degree to three kilometers, that means from blue to orange, uh, we don't, we don't really increase the droplet number concentration. So if there's still a large discrepancy between the black line and the orange line. But the slope of this line demonstrates that uh, we, uh, the slope is uh, in better agreement with the observations. That means the droplet number concentration, the sensitivity of the droplet number to CCN now in the high resolution model is in better agreement with the, the, the real world feature. So that's a good thing, but then we still cannot um, make up this huge, um, well, I think this is a, a, this is what, 20 versus over 100. So that's a factor of five underestimation. So the question is, how do we utilize those high resolution results to inform the low resolution model so that we can, at least make this blue line look like the orange line in terms of its, uh, the, the sensitivity of drop a number to CCN. So that's one thing that we're currently working on. And for aerosol and ACI, uh, uh, sorry, for the aerosol uh, optics and uh, uh, aerosol activation, we have developed this new machine learning based aerosol optics that achieve high accuracy at low computational cost. And we also have aerosol activation uh, that's based on machine learning uh, algorithm to reduce um, the model biases. So I'm going to show you some of the nice results. So this is a little out of order, I think, sorry. Sorry, so this is the aerosol optics uh, work that we do. And I don't, just uh, let me remind you that the traditional um, aerosol optics that's done in climate models is that we use the MECO to generate a, a large a lookup table uh, that has all kinds of aerosol mixing states and conditions. And then we use uh, Chebyshev polynomials uh, to fit that the lookup table. Um, and the results shown here is the parameterization in the y-axis versus the, uh, the mean calculation in the x-axis. So uh, the gray area is the scatter, uh, the, the joint histogram, uh, uh, joint PDF in that uh, comparing the parameterization versus the observations. So you can see the parameterization doesn't really do a good job and it starts to have very weird behavior in terms of show wave extinction uh, larger than two, and it generally has this bias as well. And this red lines actually uh, con uh, contains all the uh, neural network samples. 
So you can see from here that the neural network does really a nice job of uh, predicting the uh, aerosol optics that, um, compared to the traditional parameterization. So the way that we build this, but then of course, uh, the originally it was really, really expensive to achieve this accuracy. But uh, Andrew Geis uh, developed this uh, method to do this random uh, neural, neural, uh, random neural network architecture so that you can use random search to find the optimal configurations and you drop the neurons that's, that doesn't contribute to improving the accuracy so that because now with this new randomly uh, uh, selected neural network, you have less layers and less neurons in each layer and all the connections are proven to be important uh, to be included so that it, um, the, it significantly reduces the uh, computational cost, but maintain the same uh, computational accuracy. And this really lays the groundwork for the machine learning emulation of shared core optics and more complex these black carbon optics. So we're currently working on uh, uh, improving that assumption as well. So here you can see that originally the model assumed an um, uh, internal mixture uh, that you different uh, sulfur aerosols and black carbon are in the same mode, so they are internally mixed. And if you do use this assumption, the, um, then the black carbon absorption is, will be um, uh, overestimated. And there are other brown carbon assumptions or this shear core optics assumptions that can reduce that the bias. But then there's a newest uh, um, development that we uh, account for this uh, uh, different shapes and different kinds of uh, mixture of black carbon and the sulfur aerosols. So we're big, but then of course these computations are going to be very expensive. So we are developing neural networks to emulate those uh, fine uh, complex uh, mixing at this point. And we have already finished the first uh, offline uh, emulator developments, and then we are working on uh, implementing that in E3SM to assess the impact. So I'm going to back out. And the second one I want to highlight is that uh, we want to improve the uh, uh, Tumi effect uh, representation in E3SM with better aerosol activation scheme. This is the work led by Sam Silva now at the University of Southern California. He built a machine learning emulator based on explicit cloud parcel model results. And uh, we run the parcel model a uh, hundred million times, generate a big, uh, data, uh, a big data set. And then we have used this uh, two-stage training procedure so that we first uh, use a very small subset of data to train the architecture, and then use another subset to retrain the models to uh, fine-tune the model that significantly uh, reduce the, the time and uh, computational time and human time to for the model training. And we show the significant improvements on aerosol activation. So here is the comparison between parcel model truth and parameterization. In the original Abdul Rasik and Gain scheme, you can see that the parameterization doesn't really do a good job. Uh, and then with the new uh, neural network, we can see that this is a much better fit. And then uh, we put that in the E3SM, and this is the results of a column uh, of the E3SM simulations. I compare the uh, neural network um, parameterization versus the default, and we uh, largely increase the uh, droplet number concentration, which if you remember from earlier, that uh, all the climate models suffer from this low droplet number concentration uh, issue, a uh, challenge. And now uh, at least we can now say that we have partially resolved that uh, uh, bias by uh, having a better and more accurate activation scheme. And this, I know that uh, uh, Lieb and other colleagues in uh, multiple places are working on this uh, uh, using machine learning to represent low conversion. Uh, so, but we are trying this from a, a slightly different angle because we are taking into account of uh, what many people are taking into account of these uh, environmental conditions, including turbulence, air density, air motion, and things like that. 
But I think there are two other things that I think is important to incorporate. One is the fact that the size uh, threshold that we artificially de determined that, that uh, uh, beyond 25 micron, that's rain and uh, smaller than that is cloud. And so we found that uh, uh, you, if you uh, have a different kind of definition of rain and clouds, meaning that if you say rain category is uh, falling hydro hydrometers, then they need to overcome the uh, air motion and they need to, uh, in the updraft, they can grow bigger in size in order to be considered as rain and in downdraft, it will be the opposite. Then uh, you no longer uh, treat mass and uh, you, you know you no longer you are no longer constrained by this artificial uh, threshold so we found that uh, when you allow that to move in the training it's going to make the training very uh, more, much more complex but then if you allow that to happen then it changes the cloud properties and change how aerosol will affect the clouds significantly so this is one thing that we're putting in our emulator and the second thing that we haven't done, but we thought that would be a natural next step is that uh, uh, currently uh, all these processes happens in maybe one second uh, time, step, time scale. But then in a climate model uh, with a, a time step of five minutes, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, then the way that we do it is that we apply the same tendency uh, to the whole five minute, 10 minute, 15 minute time step of a climate model. So this of course is not very accurate. So we are uh, working with data scientists at uh, PNNL to figure out a way to do this a better uh, int uh, integration of different uh, processes, uh, including slow and fast processes so that we can overcome this uh, typical stiff problems in numerical modeling, but that's a, uh, 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 an ongoing research area that we just started. So now coming to this slide uh, is that there are still a lot of efforts on the aerosol side. So I talk about the aerosol optics, I talk about the aerosol cloud interactions, and now we uh, also made a lot of efforts to improve the representation of aerosols. Uh, that includes the uh, use, of, including the high resolution emission and improving the wildfire aerosols, anthropogenic dust, and the new particle formation and growth, and the DMS chemistry, and the giant aerosol effects. And now they are all in our model and all have significant impacts on the simulation. And I would just want to highlight a few things that's, uh, what, uh, that's uh, um, about this uh, connection with data science. So this uh, Bing Zhao led this work to develop new particle formation mechanisms that's relevant for uh, organic aerosols. And they uh, form, uh, they, uh, they develop this uh, complex chemistry and thermodynamics of extremely low volatility organics that drive organic new particle formation. And here, uh, we show that uh, these new particle me formation mechanisms accounts for 50 to 70% of a cloud condensation nuclei high at the 0.5% supersaturation over oceans and 15 to 65% over polluted regions. So this is a huge uh, contribution to the CCN concentration. So if we don't have these mechanisms, then we are missing uh, at least a half of those uh, cloud condensation nuclei, which partially explain why the models um, cloud droplet number concentration is so low. And the question is, how many mechanisms do we need to include? And how many more traces we need to add to our model? And it's very, I don't know if it's encouraging or disappointing that uh, we did this uh, contribution analysis and we found that, so this class shows uh, nine different mechanisms and their relative importance in different regions as a function of height. So uh, the take home message here is that in different regions and different height, uh, different mechanisms dominate. So in other words, you can't just say that we only want to represent one mechanism and 
and improve the simulation for the whole world, you can. You have to include different kinds of um, mechanisms because they operate in different regions. But if you include everything here, then it's going to be very expensive to run this model. You can use that to do climate uh, simulations. So what do we do uh, next, right? And similarly, this is a uh, study that we uh, we uh, recently uh, uh, concluded that in the E3 SMSC SMDMS chemistry is represented by these three simple uh, chemical reactions. But then the real the DMS chemistry needed that includes all these uh, three dozens of reactions. If we include all these uh, reactions, it's going to improve the model significantly. But again, it's a, it becomes very, very expensive. So an idea here is that how do we um, represent the complex chemistry that's necessary for improving the aerosol simulations and new particle formations and then uh, lead to a better ACI. I think uh, there's a huge opportunity here to use machine learning methods to emulate those processes uh, so that we can do this in a computationally efficient way. And so here, just to give you a teaser that this is a paper that we are working on now, um, that this is the original uh, and this is the observations. This is the original model simulation. And you see that our model in this uh, comparison, in comparison with the observations, we are factor of two too low. But with improved the DMS chemistry, now we completely make up for that the difference here. So this is the comparison between the E3SM simulations uh, with the against the, the uh, the Southern Ocean Socrates field campaign. So yes, we can run the model uh, that includes complex chemistry to, so to improve the agreement. But in order for this to be a, a model that's affordable for a climate simulation, we need to further parameterize those chemistry. And uh, so this is an area that I'm, if you have ideas, I'm very excited to hear. So in summary, ACI uh, is still a major source of uncertainty despite decades of research, and they're typically uh, uh, attributed to coarse model resolution. Low background aerosol might be due to overly simplified new particle formation and chemistry. Overly strong CDNC, CCN relationship might be due to activation and lack of cloud droplet collision columns. Incorrect uh, liquid path CCN uh, relationship might be connected to precipitation processes and cloud adjustments. And process-oriented constraints are developed but need more work for climate scale. And we just see a lot of opportunities to use AI ML uh, as the best path forward. Uh, for example, emulating the lookup tables with simple neural network that we've done a lot of them. The community also have made a lot of uh, progress in, at this front. And then emulating the process with generative AI methods is uh, another great um, place that we are going to do. Treatment, treating the subgrid variabilities and AI-based downscaling uh, is a uh, um, very important and a very exciting new area for, for the next few years. And use of AI ML for coupling fast and slow physics use of explainable AI to decipher data in their intrinsic relationships. And I just want to say we have compiled and generated a very large amount of observational and model simulation data that are realistic and cover a wide range of conditions. It will be really fun to collaborate. Uh, so observational data, I mentioned that we have measurements of this data from ARM, uh, satellites and field campaigns. And we have a lot of model data as well from the aerosol and cloud process, process models that covers nanometer, nanometer to micrometer scales. We have developed a large AV simulation, a computational efficient large AV simulation model called Pinnacles that uh, combine with beam microphysics and run for all uh, many, many different uh, scenarios. And we have produce and archive over 200 terabytes of such data waiting to be mined. 
E3SM MMF could sub kilometer scales and the storm resolving E3SM to provide uh, uh, kilometer scale simulations and for uh, parameterizing the mesoscale uh, secondary circulations and cloud adjustments. We also have produced a large uh, ensemble of E3SM simulations that's uh, with parameters being perturbed and also with emissions being perturbed uh, uh, due to its emission uncertainty. So we produce all these model simulations data. So uh, it will be really fun to uh, look at this data together and apply uh, advanced uh, AI ML uh, algorithms to understand what this data is telling us and how to better represent these uh, processes in our model so that it can be run fast and pro uh, provide a better prediction. So Pierre and I were talking about this idea to, uh, to create uh, this platform that, so that we can uh, share ideas and the experiences and tools and data and facilitate scientific advancement by developing collaboration to tackle specific challenges together and establish a workflow to curate data so that they are AI ready, not only for our purposes, but also for other communities who need our data to build large language models or foundation models. We're currently calling this play platform for learning atmospheric predictability. So that's all from me uh, today. Thank you for uh, your time. Thank you so much, Colin. That was very interesting. Uh, we'll start with questions from maybe early career scientists in the room. Any questions? Don't be shy. There's no bad question. No, online, any questions? No. Okay, if not, maybe I'll ask a question. I was very curious why you were talking this double mode that you had in high resolution. And you made a great point actually, which is that it's not because you go to high resolution that things just, everything improves, right? So could you comment just on the fact that you had this bimodal behavior when you were going to five kilometers as opposed to, as opposed to the cost? Yeah, this one, yeah, that was very interesting. And people can think about questions in the meantime. <laughs> so I guess the first thing to say is that uh, honestly, we don't understand this bimodal behavior yet because uh, we ju also just f uh, found out about this uh, two months ago. Because the, this diagnostics has been used, uh, well, it was first uh, proposed by Ed, uh, I think it's in his 2019 paper and then we have been using this diagnosis to evaluate the uh, uh, e3sm and other climate models and then to um, compare um, where to, to 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 come up with different uh, analysis but then we just recently construct this data set at five kilometer and then we found this behavior and this is where we started to think that uh, uh, there are other environmental uh, environmental factors that's affecting this this relationship, the leak water path and the relationship. And so, the traditional way to approach this is, of course, we now we we collocate uh, aerosol cloud and reanalysis data uh, on the same five kilometer grid, and we will do a analysis cluster analysis or a regression analysis just to see how we can separate the modes and understand what's going on there. But then we are also trying to use the XAI uh, to let it learn and let it tell us what's going on, and what factors are affecting um, what behavior. So that this is what uh, our going work. Great, thanks so much. Okay, you. Um, hi, I have a question. Uh... Uh, on the slide where you showed the animation of the cloud um, ev evolution, I could see that generally the, I would say the patterns of the two animations are quite similar. Of course, the resolution is different. So I want to uh, ask if you can elaborate more about the necessity of using the right side simulation or like the 
other improvements other than just like higher resolution or we have like smaller clouds? Like what, what is the further implication of this? Yeah, this is actually, I think is a great question. And I think this should drive our uh, um, efforts in the next few years, because I think there's a, a push for climate models to, and, and the weather model to, uh, to be uh, more connected. So climate models are running at high, uh, higher and higher resolutions. And from this figure, you do see that they, their general patterns are very similar, but the details are different because the, like I said, the, the first thing we notice is that uh, aerosols and clouds are not overlapped with each other anymore. Aerosols are typically on the edge of the cloud systems. They are more uh, segregated, in other words. So the ACI from between left and right are very different. And on the left, because it's a one degree model, then every grid box, you will have some clouds and some aerosols. And when that happens, the uh, activation and cloud processes will just uh, start to force them to interact. But in the high resolution, when they are not on the same grid, they don't interact with each other. So of course, this is one thing that I think uh, very important to notice. And the second thing I think is that uh, uh, in the coarse resolution model, with a 30 minute time step and a high resolution model with one minute time step, all the processes, how aerosol affects clouds will be then uh, feedback to the dynamics and the mesoscale circulation can be triggered to uh, trigger some entrainment processes that um, counteract the aerosol albedo effect. And then, but then in the coarse resolution model, you don't have those adjustment processes going on because the time step is too long and the dynamics doesn't have, doesn't really react to that uh, changes in clouds and aerosols. So I think it's important to have both models because they are uh, designed to do different, uh, to tackle different science challenges. But then it will be really cool if we can represent those high resolution features and the adjustments uh, and the segregation between clouds and aerosols in the coarse resolution model so that the consequences of ACI between these two can be similar. But I agree with you that uh, uh, the, there's a lot of similarities between these two, which I think is a good news, right? That the original model designs is uh, somewhat uh, successful. Thank you. I really appreciate the answer. But one more question. So did you find any region where the patterns are more different? Because I'm not sure whether it's a regional simulation or a global simulation. I will, like if these patterns look similar, did you find the, uh, some region that for the two simulations you see more different patterns? Uh, so this both of them are global simulations. I just show this region because this is a regional refined mesh for this, uh, this region only, and the rest of the world is still one degree model. So, uh, so you see that. And I, we did this uh, four different regions, East, North uh, Pacific, and East, North Atlantic, Southern Ocean, Central US, and they have all different behaviors. But from uh, what we can see, you can imagine that uh, uh, in the tropics or subtropics, uh, in the tropics, uh, the, you will see the largest difference because that's when the deep convection plays a role in the coarse resolution model and there's no deep convection parameterization in the high resolution model. Thank you. Any more questions before we end? Yeah, when well, in the back. I want to remind everyone, so uh, for people uh, on site, we have some great posters in the back, you know, about lead research. So feel free to gather and talk about the research at the end. So, yeah. Uh, Hi, um, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm not from this field, so this question might be really basic. Uh, but it's regarding the satellite uh, image you showed. I get it, it's related to this slide. Um, I'm wondering if the satellite resolution is comparable to the high resolution simulation you showed, and um, is the aerosol concentration directly measurable from the space, like from satellite data? Uh, 
Do you mean my first movie? Um, it was with the four panels, uh, satellite, uh, coarse resolution simulation, high resolution simulation. Um, oh, I see. This one. Yeah. Uh, so basically, how much information do we get from satellite data and um, how much we trust uh, them versus like the high resolution simulation? Yeah, this is a, hard, a question that's very hard to answer. Um, what well, satellite does measure, does have uh, data products for both clouds and aerosols. So they have MODIS and GEOS satellites have aerosol optical depth and cloud optical depth. I would say that these are pretty good uh, measurements. And then we can use aerosol optical depth in different wavelengths to uh, calculate the aerosol index, which is just ALD times the uh, angstrom exponent. And because people find that uh, uh, aerosol index is, in, is a better proxy to CCN, compared to aerosol optical depth. And uh, cloud optical depth is also a very good uh, measurement from, from satellites. But there are challenges, of course. Uh, geostationary satellites can give you higher temporal resolutions when uh, polar OBD uh, satellites only give you one measurement a day. And that's not, not in the same place uh, every day. And that's one challenge. And the second challenge is that uh, uh, a lot of this um, clouds and aerosol properties are, are where well, we need to know more information. We need to know their mass, their number, and we need to know uh, their size distribution. And these are the things that satellite cannot provide us, or they have retrievals to calculate liquid path or uh, droplet number, but the retrievals then is a algorithm that involves assumptions. So one assumption being the cloud at the elasticity, which uh, is, uh, is found to be a, a, wrong, a, a bad assumption that will generate further uh, confusion. So we just need to be careful when we use satellite data to do our analysis and to constrain, uh, to, to uh, develop a constraints. And so there's always a need for field, to use field campaign to understand what the true uh, state variables should look like and then use them to uh, understand the satellite's limitations and also the model's behavior. I hope that answers your question. Great. Any more questions or maybe online? Uh, maybe in the chat there might be one. No. Okay. So if we don't have any more questions, so again, uh, I suggest you, if people can join, I mean, we have some great posters in the back to uh, like showcase some of the research we're doing in the center, especially from early career scientists. And thanks so much, Colonia. I hope we can have you here one day. Yeah. So good luck with the program managers. <laughs> we know how it is. Yeah. Thank you, Pierre. Thanks all. <laughs>